Hey class, in this second lecture on the problem of pain, I want to talk about what might be the most important lecture of all the lectures I'm going to give you. And the reason I say it's the most important is because I think it's the most relative to your generation, all of the Gen Zs out there. There are many, many young people today who disbelieve a God or at the very least they're apathetic about it. They are casual agnostics. They just don't know. And I am convinced from a lot of my conversations with young people that this is because of circumstances in their life that are unexplained. Difficulties in their life, pain that they've experienced, and they just don't understand how God could allow something like that to happen in their life. And so in this apologetics class, I want to take an entire lecture and talk about it. I think it's so important for you not only to know this for yourself, but for you to know this for friends and loved ones of yours to help them. People in this world are suffering. There's so much pain around us. And ironically, the only hope, the only solution is in Christ, is in the good news about Jesus. I truly believe that the only solution and the only thing that can give us relief from pain is Christianity and the truth within it. And that's what many people are running from. And if we're honest, I think Christians play a large role in that. So I want to talk to us about ration, and I want us to talk about emotion. Because I don't believe people today mostly are atheistic because of a philosophical argument. I believe most people are atheists today because of the problem of pain. How could God allow this to happen to me? In the introduction of C.S. Lewis's book on the problem of pain, he has some of my favorite reading that I've ever done. It's just so incredible to read, and it just uh, makes you smile as you read it. This is what C.S. Lewis says. The creatures cause pain by being born and live by inflicting pain, and in pain they mostly die. In the most complex of all the creatures, man yet another quality appears, which we call reason, whereby he is able to foresee his own pain, which henceforth is preceded with acute mental suffering, and to foresee his own death while keenly desiring permanence. It also enables man, by a hundred ingenious contrivances, to inflict a great deal more pain than the other wise could have done on one another and on the irrational creatures. This power they have exploited to the full. Their history is largely a record of crime, war, disease, and terror, with just sufficient happiness interposed to give them, while it lasts, an agonized apprehension of losing it. And when it is lost, a poignant misery of remembering. Okay, so that was one of those paragraphs where you have to read it a few times and chew on it because it's heavy reading. But the idea is that we're born in pain, we live in pain, we die in pain, and in the middle of being born and dying, uh, we're remembering pain that we suffered and we're anticipating pain that we're about to suffer And so there's just so little enjoyment in this world. Now, I want to make a little note here because I do believe in our culture here in America today, we don't really know what suffering is like. 
what real suffering is. Now, I know there's a good chance here amongst my students that there are people who have gone through some incredible pain that I know nothing about. Um, I'm sure I have students who have experienced some kind of abuse that I can't begin to imagine. I don't want to minimize that even a little bit because I honestly cannot imagine what that's like. But I'm more talking about our culture as a whole. We live in a time period of peace, not war. If we were to rewind the clock, you know, a hundred years to World War I or 200 years ago to, um, uh, to the Civil War, 200 plus years ago to the Civil War, and we were to live in a time period where the men were going off to war and not coming home, um, or we were to live with bombs blowing up all around us, uh, we would have a different take on this idea of pain. Uh, so in, in one sense, we haven't experienced pain like some in the world are. But having said that, each and every one of us experiences pain, whether it's physical or emotional, and it's a real thing. We suffer as human beings. The dark reality is that the world, for as long as we can look back, has been a world full of pain. What I have found to be true in the world today is that most people who do not believe in God do not believe in God because of pain that they have experienced. How could God, if he loves them, allow them to suffer? And what about Christianity? Doesn't it teach that God allowed his own son to be killed? Isn't that divine child abuse? I had someone ask me that just a couple of years ago here in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Didn't God allow his own son to die? What C.S. Lewis sets out to show in the problem of, of pain is that Christianity creates rather than solves the problem of pain. For without the grace of God, we would not even know anything righteous and loving. And this goes back to our conversation about the reality of the moral law. But the moral law that God has placed within our hearts tells us what is good and what is bad. It tells us uh, what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. And this whole concept of pain is something that we experience, but we know what good is because of God's grace. God has been so good to us. He has blessed us with so much that, we, that, that pain is actually a reality to us when it comes about. The moral law teaches us what we ought to do. That is, it teaches us what is good. And by God's mercy, he extends good to us, even though we have rejected him. So up until now, we have focused on the pain that others have caused us. What you will notice when you talk to someone who's hurt is they will almost always talk about the person who hurt them. They will almost always talk about how could God allow me to be hurt? But what so infrequently we hear talked about, and we must include ourselves in this, is the pain that we have brought upon others. And I will also say the pain we've brought upon ourselves. Now, right now, each one of you, my students, is going to be tempted. When I said to you the pain you have brought upon yourself and others, you were tempted to think, no, Scott, I have never really hurt anyone. Not intentionally. And if I had, they probably deserved it. We now must stop for a moment and talk about the problem of evil and the problem of evil inside of us. The problem of evil that is in every single person under the sound of my voice. 
This last year, Christy and I did a parenting seminar. Uh, it was virtual. It was online. And a man by the name of Paul Tripp was the teacher. And he taught us that the number one responsibility of a parent is to teach their children that they have evil in their hearts. Now, this contradicts so much of what we hear in the world today in regards to parenting and people. Because what is being pushed in our culture today is that humans are good, that you are good. Think good thoughts about yourself. I recently heard a song where the artist was trying to encourage the listener and saying, you are good. And, and in, in the words of the song, it said, you are divinity defined. You are God inside. Those are the lyrics of the song. And this idea that you, you, you are a good person. You think good thoughts about yourself. Be positive. No, actually, you're evil. I'm evil. We have evil inside of our hearts. Even our good has wrong motives. That's the reality. So often the question is asked, how could God have allowed this to happen to me? But how often have you heard it asked, how could, how could have God allowed me to experience his grace? How could have Jesus allowed human evil to kill him? How could God forgive me for what I've done to him? I want us to move over to Mere Christianity and look at book number four, chapter number seven, under Let's Pretend. And this is on page 187. This is one of my favorite chapters. And we'll talk more about this chapter in the next lecture, but I want to highlight something on page 192. Lewis talks about someone who has discovered the goodness of God and something they will begin to realize. He says this, quote, We begin to notice besides our particular sinful acts, our sinfulness. Begin to be alarmed, not only about what we do, but about what we are. We see this in the New Testament where Paul, in his first letter to Timothy, wrote this, Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with love, he filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. The truth is that we give ourselves too much credit. We're talking about why God allows pain, why God allows me to suffer. And last lecture, we talked about free will. This lecture, I want to talk about the reality that we bring so much of our pain on ourselves. And yes, other people have hurt us. I know that. I sympathize with you. But have you hurt anybody else? Of course you have. We give ourselves too much credit. And in the next lecture, I want to talk about the ultimate solution and what God has done through Jesus. But I don't want to let ourselves off the hook. You and I are not innocent. We talked about blame when we talked about the moral law. And you and I are to blame. You and I have evil in our hearts. We have rejected the goodness of God. We have done harm to each other. And we have, we have done harm to ourselves. We blame being tired on our ill temper, 
But notice we don't credit a good night's rest for our good temper. <laughs> I want you to chew on that for a second. When I fly off the handle and get upset, I say to my wife, I say, I'm sorry, I didn't get good sleep last night. But when someone comes up to me and they say, man, you were, you're, you're such a patient dad. You're, you're, boy, I, I, lo I love watching you parent. You're a good, I don't say to that person, well, I, I got a good night's sleep last night. You see, we, we give ourselves credit for our good behavior and we excuse our bad behavior. I want you to think about this. We blame the refs for losing the game. But how often do you hear someone give the refs credit when your team won the game? We view our worst rounds in golf as a bad day, while we view our best days as normal. What we don't do is view ourselves as we are at our worst, but maybe we should. Maybe that's who we really are. Before we get a chance to put a mask on. And I want you now to look at one of the most incredible analogies that C.S. Lewis has ever given. One of my favorites, if not my favorite. The analogy of rats in the cellar. Oh, I love this. Quote, If there are rats in a cellar, which is a basement, you are most likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. <laughs> have you guys ever done that before? I have. Have you ever opened up a basement door really quickly and it was dark in there and you saw rats scurry off? Yeah. If there are rats in a cellar, C.S. Lewis says, you are most likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. But the suddenness does not create the rats. It only prevents them from hiding. <laughs> Pause the video and chew on that for a second. When you open the cellar doors, the rats go running. But the darkness did not create the rats. It only gave them a reason to hide. What a man does when he has taken off his guard is the best evidence for what sort of man he is. You might give an excuse as to why you acted a certain way, but the reality is the excuse you gave took you off guard and showed you who you really are. That's who you are before you got a chance to put the mask on and pretend you are who you're not really. The reality is that every single one of us were broken. We struggle day after day with doing what we ought to do. We do not live up to the standards that other people have set for us. We do not live up to the standards that we set for ourselves. And if we lower our standards so that we can live up to the standards, then we feel bad that we're the type of person that sets low standards. We're broken. We need help. We need to be rescued. And when we talk about the problem of pain and suffering, we must understand free will. We must. We have a choice to choose. We can do good or we can do bad. We can do evil. We can do good. And oftentimes we choose to do that which is evil. We, do, we choose to do that which is wrong. And even when we choose to do good, we often do it with the wrong motive. Some of you may have been in my spiritual formation class. One of my favorite analogies that I gave in that class was the analogy 
of helping someone who has a flat tire. And I talked about this when we talked about service. We can, we often serve other people to get acceptance from them. And then we often don't serve because it's an inconvenience. So when we have an opportunity to serve, we say, nah, I don't feel like it. Or if we say, yeah, I feel like it, we're only doing it to earn acceptance. And I gave you the analogy of a flat tire. You're driving down the road and you see a car and they're pulled over to the side of the road and there's a flat tire and naturally, as we all do, you look over to see if you know the person. And if you don't know the person, you keep driving. Just say, phew, sucks to be them. But imagine you know the person and it's someone that you really like. Or shall I say, it's someone that you really want to like you. And you pull the car over, you back up, you jump out, and you say, can I help you? Are you actually helping them because they have a need? Or are you helping them because you want them to know that you helped them? If it's not someone you know, you keep driving because it's an inconvenience to you. So at no point are you helping the person with a flat tire because they actually have a need. That is what the gospel does inside of our hearts. Is it causes us to do good simply because... It's right to do. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. But I simply want to point out to us in this lecture that even the good that we do is often tainted. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Or, as Timothy Keller so well puts it, Christians are not only those who have learned to repent for, their, for what they've done wrong, but also for the reasons that they do right. Now, if you'll chew on that and let it sink deep into your mind. The Pharisees were the people that Jesus criticized the most. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, your lips are close to me, but your hearts are far from me. Uh, you honor me with your lips. The things that you're saying are all good, wonderful things, but I know your hearts. Your heart wants to put God into a corner and force him to bless you because, after all, you were a good boy or a good girl. The reality is... When we talk about the problem of pain, we've got to talk about the evil in the world. And if we're going to talk about the evil in the world, we've got to talk about the evil inside the heart of Scott Mercer. See you next class.